Good morning, good evening, whatever time you're listening. I am your host, Christopher. Welcome to another episode of The Practical People. This is part two of my interview with actor Doug Tate, who has a lot of experience working in the world of practical effects. It's not easy uh, putting on a suit and or putting on a makeup and becoming a character. Uh, but we're going to talk about what that's like, the pros and cons with actor Doug Tate. So welcome to this portion of your interview on The Practical People. Thanks for being on. Thank you. <laughs> I, 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 uh, I dozed out for a second and you're talking to me. Hey, thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> Did you literally doze off? Oh, no, I'm working you too hard in the interview. <laughs> I was I was just thinking about a life of haunt right now and then and then I was like oh you're talking to me okay oh, okay all right cool. <laughs> I was like oh no I'm boring him to death this is a great way to start the show <laughs> but yes we were we were talking about uh, your show the haunt which is uh, you talked about in the other episode is is your uh, TV pilot about working in a haunt and I can actually relate to this a lot because my I, I like to think that my career in filmmaking and in special effects started with the fact that I, as a kid, used to set up a haunted house in my garage every year. I, I was I had, was lucky enough because in the 80s, this is harder to get a hold of, but I had access to a smoke machine and a black light and strobe light, and hung chains and spider webs and would dress up. And uh, I was also inspired by was it Iron Maiden's Eddie Iron Maiden coming out on the stage so i'd try and create some giant creature in the garage to scare the neighborhood kids with and it was always successful it was like people were you know parents were telling my parents hey my kids wanted to skip houses to come here so you had a very similar um kind of passion for halloween when you were a kid didn't you oh absolutely all the stuff you just mentioned is exactly what i did i got black lights i had a smoke machine i had tons of math i made bodies i mean i did everything i did all that and was very successful i would dress up i would you know act like i was a dummy and scare people (laughs) you know i I did all those things that we're seeing now back then when a lot of people weren't doing them it oh man it was just it was so much fun i mean my my favorite was a, a dad uh, there were two. One was a drunk dad that you know was just like coming up to my dad, going like, "Every year, it's just amazing. This is fan. Like we love it. We look forward to it." That was number one. And the other was a uh, a little kid um, standing out front of the garage crying because his dad was going, "You made us walk all this way, skipping houses, and now you don't want to go in." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, exactly that. And- was like it was like a passion it was like a love and i love that and, and yeah that's kind of uh that's kind of where it all started you know i think i really feel like it was halloween that, that started all the stuff that i do um whether i know it or not i mean that's that's where it all comes from so that pilot kind of kind of has you know that love in there of halloween and haunted houses which i i would go to and be scared as a kid but just loved it loved doing that so you also did Universal Studios, which has gotten quite a reputation for, for its haunts. Uh, and then you kind of, you found yourself starting to be the monsters in, in some of the movies you love. You said you, was it uh, Freddy versus Jason, where you got to be Jason at the uh, end? Was that kind of the, the first big one that you did? It was. It was absolutely the first big one. I, I got cast as uh, Frankenstein in the, um, and it was really, really funny at the time. I played Frankenstein in the 100th episode of Sabrina the Teenage Witch. <laughs> and and I was playing Frankenstein in the park at Universal at the time. And it was this weird thing of like life imitating art because I spoke. And I was like talking like this is my job as Frankenstein. And that was the first, you know, not big, but something where I was on a TV show and I was a guest star. And then after that, Freddy vs. Jason definitely was the one where I was like, wow, this is iconic. And I kind of used that to do more. Um, and, and then it kind of slowly, slowly started to happen from that, you know. And, and I got to say, by the way, just... Um, 
Sabrina the Teenage Witch was actually a really fun show. So I I, I kind of think there's there's some cool cred in that as well. Uh, just just as a you know as an aside. Uh, now I one of the things that was really funny to me was uh, I think was it Star Trek? You were like an alien in a bar, and uh, I think that that's at the point where my wife said, "Hey, I went to school with that guy." I was like, oh, really? Oh, that's kind of cool. I was like, which guy? It's like the, the alien. I was like, oh, the alien? That's really cool. So did you kind of, like, for a bit, you just kind of uh, started being known as, as somebody? Because I, I hear a lot of people complain when makeup gets put on them or something heavy and that they don't want to do it. So if you're someone who doesn't complain and, and does a good job, they'll keep calling you back. Well, yeah, that was one of the things where it was like, okay, you know, I was struggling as an actor, and here I got cast as Jason, and then I got into Zethura, and then from Zethura, you know, some other things came, and then, you know, yeah, then Star Trek came, which my friend Barney Berman is when I met him um, uh, on that, who's done a ton of stuff, and his family's been around. Um, but once I did that, and then I did Land of the Lost, I was like, okay, this is, this is something, you know, like, I... It was, it's hard and it's tough, but there's also this sense of, and I think it goes back to Halloween and be working at Universal, where I get these characters, like I immediately submit myself to them and bring them to life. And yeah, it's uncomfortable, it's tough, but I don't complain. And I'm also grateful that I'm getting an opportunity to work in these movies and work with J.J. Abrams. And then, you know, you're making a living. And you're not struggling. So it was a lot of that at the, at the time going, wow, this is incredible. I'm getting opportunities and I'm struggling so hard just to get a one liner on a show or whatever. And um, so it was kind of kind of using that and going, OK, people are hiring me for something. I'm going to run with this. That's kind of how it all all began. Is there a um, I, I mean, you are uh, outside of the makeup and the suit. You are a, a, an actor. Uh, is there a difference in acting? Is is this more about emoting, or are the techniques similar? You just kind of have to push them through the uh, the makeup and the foam rubber. Yeah, no, it's definitely a different process. Yes, I'll think about the character and I'll figure out, you know, what you know, what what kind of uh, you know who he is based off the script, based off the design. But as far as every character is different, so um, in prosthetics. You definitely have to exaggerate um, your um, your facial expressions, and as an actor out of makeup, you would never do that. You would never look in the mirror and over accentuate your face because then it's just totally bad acting. But in makeup, you kind of have to do that, and every prosthetic reads different, so it's really great. I always try to get into a mirror or when I'm they're doing my makeup, try to figure out okay oh, when I do this, um, I could see that, that that makes him angry. And if I open my eyes, he looks excited. Um, and I have to really push that. So, so yeah, it, it, you know, it's a different process. Um, even if you have, like, a mindset of what your character's going through and this and that, to make it read sometimes, you have to exaggerate it, which is, which is different than regular acting. Do you work closely with the the people who create the prosthetics? Because obviously you have to go in and do a life cast, but uh, I'd imagine that you have to communicate with them uh, about what's working for you and what's not. You know, maybe they're making the prosthetic too thick in spots or, um, you know, maybe... I do. I do. No, I totally do. And, And now that I've done it a lot, I really understand it more. You know, before it was like you just kind of, I just show up and whatever they do, I, I, I work with. But now I have such an understanding from being in so much of it where I can, like... And sometimes you don't even have the time. Sometimes TV is, like, so quick. I'm on a show right now, Legacies, and, and we had a whole week of fittings before I started. And that was so great because me and the artist collaborate. So I'm like, oh, you know what? And from experience, I'm going, you know what? This is going to be tough with this hand because I'm not going to get to... I'm not going to have much function with it. What if we did this? And what if we tried to, you know, like make it not so big where I could move it more? And 
you know, things like that. Uh, I do try to collaborate, and they'll listen to me now because I have experience, and they know that what I say is it has value, and I'm saying something that's going to make them look better. So, um, yeah, it's a great thing to collaborate and make it the best it could be. Absolutely. Is uh, I, I don't. What would you say for a, a somebody creating a, a prosthetic or or a suit? Because sometimes, I mean. In Hellboy, you had a whole animatronic head on your... You were carrying around a big weight. I mean, how much did that thing yeah. weigh, by the way? <laughs> that thing weighed 50 pounds, man. That was a really difficult character. It weighed oh, 50 man. pounds. Animatronics, I couldn't see well. And that's another thing. And an animatronic head is, is so much different. And and this the way this, this character moved, I played him almost like he was like, you know, kind of like a beaten dog. He was a little like... He had been abused and this and that, so he's hunched and I'm squatted, and it's really difficult. And also the way the eyes were set, I had to look at the ground in order for for it the eyes to be in the correct position. So when I looked straight, the eyes were in the air. So getting used to just walking the way I had to walk and all that weight, all that heat, not being able to see well. And having to look at the ground, and, and, you know, I had to fight David Harborough. I had to act with Mila, and I'm stepping on her dress. And all that you're dealing with and all all that, it really took time to, to try to hone into that character. And I finally did get it, but it was it was a tough one, man. It, it was a really tough one. Do you, and this is kind of where I was uh, going in terms of, like, uh, people who are aspiring makeup artists or effects artists and that sort of thing. Uh, I'd imagine that's a very important thing for them to think about because they could potentially uh, create something that looks cool, but you couldn't function in it all. And it, and it happens all the time. Let me tell you, there's certain shops that they, they base everything off look and they don't think about function and I'll get in it and I'll kill myself, you know? And then if it's not me, if it's, if they hire somebody that's not experienced, um, the thing doesn't function at all, and then they're pissed off at the performer or the shop or whatever. So you know, there's a lot of a lot of people that do that. They don't think of that. Like Henson's is one where they pride themselves on making it the best function it can be, and then they they work around the look. You know, and, and that's why they're so good at. You know, if you see the suits and dark crystal and this and that. They function so well because they're, they're, that's their thought process. And I don't want to name names of the shops that don't <laughs> do that. But there's a lot of them that don't, and, and you'd be surprised, you know. And they, they, they make these great things, and, and I know so many, they don't function right, you know. And they make it so hard, and I'll do my best. It's like, you know, I've been in stuff 150 pounds, and I'll still make a move. And it would be so much better if they didn't weigh that and they don't have to weigh that. But, you know, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a tough thing, especially when you're in animatronics and, and you're in a full suit, man. I mean, it's, it's like, it's death. I mean, people would get in that that haven't experienced it and forget about playing the character. They're just trying to survive. <laughs> wow. Well, I mean, you say 150 pounds. I, uh, when I worked at Studio ADI, for a hot minute, Alec had a character. He's like, you're tall and skinny. It's like, would you want to try being this character? We're going to put an 11-pound animatronic on your head, though. And I was like, oh, I better, 11 pounds, I better start working out my neck. So I, could, yeah. <laughs> I couldn't imagine yeah. 150 pounds. Uh, I mean, do you get... I know. Do directors, um, you know, sympathize? I mean, do you get to communicate with directors and say, like, hey, this is you know, I could give you a better performance if, or is most of the time it's just like, hey, jump in that thing and make it happen? A lot of times it's jump in that thing and make it happen. And then, um, you know, a lot of times you're sought after. So that some, some people just think, well, you know, that's what we're hiring them for. But, you know, I'm also a human being. And, you know, when you're in lifts and, and you have... 35 pound arms and you're fighting and it's the ground's uneven there's bodies on the floor and you can't see well i mean there's there's certain limitations you know I'll, I'll, a 
lot of the stuff I'm doing is based off instinct and my training, and uh, and I get by. But it doesn't mean it. It could be a lot better if it was built a little to make it easier for me. And Hellboy was rushed. I mean, it was like they decided to shoot it. They had a few weeks to build this thing, and then something wasn't working in the head and they had to get someone from Henson's to fix it. And then by the time I got into it and it was, it was just like, it, it could have been done a little more functional, but you know, I did my best to, to do the job that I could do, but it took, it takes a while for your brains and body to be able to get comfortable in there and figure out the movements when you can't see and you got to have your head down. It, you know, it's a really, it's really difficult. Well, I have to credit you because as far as uh, you know, reviews of Hellboy went, and I, I won't dive into the actual reviews of Hellboy, but yeah. one of the constants in the, on the positive side was that your character, uh, they thought it was really cool. So, yeah. you know, that cool. at least there's that, you know, you, you really did kind of give it your all and, and produce a character that people uh, felt stood out and was memorable. I'd imagine that, you know, you, you mentioned people just throw you in and go, well, this is what we're paying this guy for. He does this. But, you know, I always kind of think, yeah, that's what you're paying him for. But you also have to listen to his, uh, you, you know, his information based on his experience. You know, he, yeah. he, you're he, you're there to sure. get the best performance and you're also there to tell them what can be done to create that performance because it's not like you said it's not just being an actor it's a synergy between you and the practical effects team so if they're like you said like jim henson uh company they're gonna be a lot better to work with in that sense i'd imagine absolutely yeah you know and and you know there's shops that that are better about it than others um um but but yeah i mean you know, I think that I think that the Hanson mentality is the greatest way to go about it because if you're if your guy can't move in the thing, then what's the point? You know, this isn't a prop that's going to be sitting there. This is something that's part of the story, and a lot of the times it's one of the biggest you know villain of the story. So for it not to move right, and you know, there's there's movies that this happened to recently that a friend did, uh, Axel. The thing couldn't even move, you know. You know when that happens, I just think that that you're missing the whole point of of making the character. You know, like it's got to be functional. So if the design has to change a little for that, then then so be it. You know, because that's the best. That's the that's the thing you're trying to get to do is for it to function. Yeah, to to come to life and and be a character. So yeah, if it's rigid. Exactly. Yeah. That's all the, you know, the memes you see of like the old 1950s monsters, you know, they just <laughs> look yeah. like guys trying to not fall over. Uh, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> the dinosaurs and stuff are like, oh. <laughs> now, yeah. uh, you've, you've worked with uh, an, another uh, suit performer that I know is, is Tom Woodruff Jr. And I, I, I believe you've got to work with the folks at Studio ADI now. Tom is he's he's been in that suit and he's you know he says he's gone eight hours without having to go to the bathroom or shivering you know being drenched or or being too hot uh you know so I'd imagine that they're probably a bit more sensitive to the needs of the suit performer than say a, a less experienced shop yeah I think Tom is like out of anybody that's as a shop owner is the most knowledgeable about being in a suit. I mean, others have done it, but not to the extent he's done it. And he's played some really iconic characters. And I'll, I'll give it to him if he, if he doesn't have to go to the bathroom because I'm the opposite. I'm <laughs> hydrating constantly. And I'm like, when they're building it, I'm telling them, I'll make sure I got that pee hole because uh, I'm not going to be taking the suit off every 10 minutes. I have to go to the bathroom. But, uh, <laughs> I give it to him for him for being able to, to, to be that that dedicated and, and holding it. But uh, yeah, Tom Tom's amazing, and you know he's done stuff in the '80s that you know I was movies I was watching. So we've had great conversations about stuff. 
And it's unfortunate because even Tom has said that a lot of the people in the business won't even listen to his opinion on getting a, a guy like me or, or him that where the stunt coordinators hired and and it even happened on Predator. They're just like, Yeah, we're just the stunt guy's gonna hire the people and it's like how how is that possible? And then they end up having problems where the guy's, you know, freaking out on set, you know, and and, and, and that's just mind boggling to me that you got the guy who has the experience contact, been in suits, he's been making suits for thirty something, forty years. And you're not even going to listen to his opinion on on who to who to hire for this. It's just crazy to me. Yeah, this. I mean, there's certain people that. I, I mean, I I think it's amazing. You you have to be physically fit. You have to be lean, but you also have to have huge endurance. Uh, you know, not just your bladder, but like I said, I, I believe Tom was saying that on uh, Aliens versus Predator Requiem. He was in that suit, and they're just raining down, freezing cold rain, and it's getting into the it's the suit, yeah. and it's you know it's it's robbing his muscles of energy because that's something that happens too. People don't realize that your muscles, yeah, are, you know they are they're working on energy, and if you're uh, freezing them out, that's you're taking all the energy out of the muscles, which you just can't hold yourself up. So, yeah. Exactly. You know. Well, that's that's the thing. Even if you're fit and you're thin and you have endurance, that doesn't mean that you could you have the experience to be in a suit and perform the character and 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 understand the acting of it and and how to make it come to life. Because I know a lot of stunt guys that have been thrown and stuff. They were the most fit uh, athletes you can know, but they're thinking about the stunt and they're so overwhelmed with the heat and everything else that they don't even know what to do. So even that being said, somebody like Tom or Doug or myself having the experience and being fit and being flexible and understanding character and being an actor, it's, 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 it's a skill. And when, it, whenever it's kind of glossed over, you know, it's like, oh, we're just going to hire a, a stunt guy or, you know, and I'm not saying anything about stunt people because I give it to them for what they're doing. But I'm saying in in the talking about being somebody in a suit or a makeup, you know, it's a skill just like a martial artist is a skill. You don't just go, oh, I'm, we're just going to get anybody to, to do this martial arts role. Like, it doesn't matter that that's kind of the same thing, you know, and, and, and that bugs me when that happens and it's happened a lot. And, and that's one of the reasons why I started, you know, getting into stunts just so I could, you know, people would know me when I get cast in these characters where, oh, yeah, Doug, I, I've heard his name. He could be physical. Not that I wanted to do stunts. is more to, to have a name where, hey, I, we can hire this guy because he's an athlete and he's done some stunt stuff and it's open doors, you know, for me playing characters. I, I also kind of just want to point out, too, I mean, you, I... I see your Instagram and I, I see you on Facebook. I mean, you're in constantly in incredible shape. Um, and I was also kind of, I, it was very interesting to me to see Doug Jones Instagram because here's a guy who stays incredibly lean, but to think that he's frail or, or weak would be uh, an incredible uh, mis mistake to believe that because he is like doing these amazing yoga poses. I see pictures of him with his trainer. They're like holding each other up in the air and he's oh, yeah. always doing these very, um, these poses that are very kind of strange moves and things with his hands. I mean, it's, it's, it is kind of like a martial art in a way, but it's, it's a performance martial art where he's, uh, he's learned to kind of strike these poses that emote those, uh, those feelings physically. Absolutely. Yeah. No, it's, it's, you know, nobody could handle doing that and, and the stamina to be in a makeup if they just are, are, are a stick, you know, like being thin is just part of his DNA <laughs> and that's how he is, but he works on his flexibility. He works on those things and there's no way getting to the age he's getting to be able to do those things just based off, Oh, he's skinny. I mean, it's just, it's, it's just, it's ridiculous. He, he obviously trains and, and stuff like that. So, <laughs> What's your regiment like? I mean, I know you, you've transitioned more into uh, acting what I would call, I guess for lack of a better word, regular parts. You're doing more of that now, but I, I'd imagine yeah. you're still uh, 
Yeah, I, I think you're still doing the Sasquatch commercials, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, the thing is, is uh, once I started working this way, and also, um, also, you know, getting older. Like I've always been an athlete all my life, and I've never stopped fitness. But my fitness has changed in the last ten years. It used to be just lifting weights and playing basketball. And now it's more tailored to like calisthenics, and I do a lot of a lot of animal movement exercises. I found these animal movements called animal flow, and I got into that, where it's a whole workout of movements, doing different movements mixed with rings and bar, and um, and I still play basketball, and, and so it's I, I work on all aspects of fitness, and when I have a role, I try to train my body to match what I'm going to be doing in that role. So if it's something like hall boy, for instance, I was training with a weight vest bent over with my legs and like a, a crouched basketball guarding position. So it's very awkward and uncomfortable, but I'm trying to get those muscles and flexibility um, to become like, cause if I, if I feel like it's hard doing something, then I'm not in the moment of the character. But if I can get those muscles you know, ready and where it's, it's like second nature, then I could get into the, the movement of the character. So that's what I try to do. And, and I continually um, work on more movement based calisthenic stuff, as opposed to like the guy at the gym, just doing their, you know, weight routine. So your, your exercises actually are, uh, your routine changes according to the character. I guess that's yeah. an anticipation of, of what you're going to wear, but I'd imagine it also kind of trains your body to, to posture for that creature. Absolutely. Absolutely. When I know I'm playing a character, I'll look at the design and talk to the director if I can, or the makeup artist. And, and then if I have fittings, I'll get more of a sense for it. And then I'll start training that. Like for instance, in Annabelle, I knew that it was going to be on like my toes the way the shoes were. So I started training in uh, those jump shoes in a squat position hunched over um, just to get like the back muscles and the legs engaged because it's different than just doing a squat at a gym. It's a totally different thing. So being in that position hunched over and then also having a, like a big head on, uh, I, I tried to train my body for a good couple weeks before I got on that so then once I got on there it was kind of like my muscles were ready to go and I could perform the character uh, the, to the best I can so if I don't have a character then I'm doing a lot of movement stuff and doing you know strength things I'll do yoga I'll do balance and and, and every every week I do the animal movement thing it's called animal flow it's an amazing workout and it's like doing yoga with movement. It's like constantly uh, engages so many different muscles, and it's cardiovascular. And it's fun. It's like a flow. It's not like a workout. I'm like, like I'm not going. Oh, I got to do this set of it. It's just I just get into this flow state, and it brings back the basketball days where I'm not playing basketball to get a workout. I'm playing basketball because I enjoy it. So that's kind of my uh, my routines. It sounds awesome. I mean, even uh, was it Kung Fu uh, takes a lot from a animal movements. I mean, they, they literally have yep. uh, mo moves and uh, poses that they are named after. You know, t it, the most famous is, and it's kind of become a joke, but like praying mantis or, you know, monkey stealing fruit, something like that. Crane, uh, you know, it, it's... I mean, there yeah. is a logic to that, but it's a, it's great because it helps you create a character. With with Annabelle, exactly. you know, you do a, a routine like that to to get into, you know, a werewolf character. Have you ever had a, a special effects artist look at what you're doing and going like, "Oh, that's great. Maybe I can, you know, change the design to accentuate that move." Um. Mm. Not really on the on the movement side. I, I think more of when I, I get into it, going, oh, you know what? I think that if this if this is uh, the head's position this way, it's going to be harder for me. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, not really in that sense, but in other in other ways. Um, it, the, whenever I can collorate with them, then it's then that's amazing. You know, do you have it a favorite? Doesn't always happen. 
Do you have a favorite character? And maybe not a favorite character, like how it appeared on screen, but just, uh, you know, uh, what was like your best experience where you felt like, yeah, this is everything that it needs to be. Yeah, you know, there's been a there's been a few uh, actually. The Sasquatch is is a great one for me. You know, just because it's ongoing, and the more I've done it, the more I sink into that, and the more I've explored it, and it, it's just it's second nature where I don't have to think; I just go. That's the best when you when you're so ingrained in, in what what it is. Because because when you're when you're um, when your brain has to think about what it's doing, you're not fully immersed in the character, and when it's so relaxed, just like I like playing basketball. I don't have to think because I've done it so long. When when I get to that point in a role, that's the bet because then I'm just in the moment I'm playing, you know. So that's one. I really like my character on the Grimm, the final season, the Zer Store. That was an awesome one, and I got to do so much. And then there's this character on the a show called The Quest that I love, named Verlox. I just posted pictures about it because it was. <laughs> fifth anniversary but it was like this regal demon that spoke and i was at these 16th century castles in in uh, in vienna it was my backdrop i had this huge army and i just i would command them and they would go in battle and it just felt so epic and amazing it sounds to me like it, now you know this goes to the old adage about acting that acting is reacting when you like you know going back to sasquatch i watch those commercials they're hilarious and a lot of times you have rotating cast with you as the constant and it's almost like you you're you're giving a performance as much for them and and getting a reaction and then kind of feeding into that at least that's the impression i get that's so it's so great that you notice that because that's exactly what i'm going for like when I get to play and they use that, that's when the funniest stuff comes out. When I get to explore and get reactions from the people and then play off those reactions and they play off me, then whatever's written is, you know, whatever's written is never as good as what comes off the cuff in the moment. You know, it's the same thing we talked about in the last interview of just, just kind of, you know, not planning anything. Because what you get when you're not planning stuff that comes organically is the is is what the audience enjoys the most, you know. So so absolutely, I, I just try I try to get reactions and things from people and improv sometimes, and and that's when the gold happens. It yeah, it really does come through, especially you know, and it, it was kind of nice too. You, I know you're a big. Uh, you're big into basketball and you got to do some Sasquatch playing basketball. And, you know, that was, it it just kind of, there were some really funny moments like when you're in the locker room with the other athletes and you're doing things with wind blowing through your hair. And it's like, it, it really is something that I think it's, it's always fascinating watching commercials that have ongoing characters and, and how, those characters evolve over time and some of them like peak and then they kind of go downhill um or you know some of them just like almost become their own stories i mean i i even think what was it like the caveman from what was it geico i think they tried to give him his own tv show at some point they did did. so you know But yeah, that, I mean, that's really cool to hear, though, because I think ultimately that's a synergy that is a, a constant in, you know, whether you're performing in a suit or if you're, you know, part of a, a cast on set, you know, just being a character without that makeup on. So it, yeah. it's fun to hear. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like for some reason, whatever it is with me, I feel like if I'm able to kind of go off the cuff and improv, that's the best for me. If I have to stick to a script, obviously you have to in shows and things. I, I, I don't feel like I'm at my best. I try to be, you know, I feel my best when I'm able to like have it a little loose, you know. There's certain directors I've had a lot. All di- every every director pretty much in the set in the Jack Links has been different every time. There's been a couple that have come back, but it's the ones that let me play and then they see things and throw stuff out and I go with it. Those have been the best commercials. The ones that are 
so rigid and they just tell me what I need to do and then they tell me the mark to hit, that's when I feel like the character is the least funny. You know, um, it's interesting, you know, like, uh, I try to, I try to bring myself out with those directors, but at times like they're, they're so like stuck in their head that when I see the commercial, it, it absolutely isn't as fun. I, I'm also interested in, you know, does that synergy work as well with, you know, if you're working with an animatronic people puppeteering part of your performance offset, do you ever kind of hit that kind of stride with them? Like they go, Oh, that was cool. What if we did this? And yeah, absolutely. Like the puppeteers that have been around that know their stuff will go based off me. If I go down and I move up and like, then they know that I'm going to growl, you know, like, and then they'll move the mouth. If I'm doing something else, then they'll, they'll understand how the face should be or the eyes. And it is like a synergy, you know, because they're, a lot of, I can't go off them because I can't see what they're doing. So they're going off me and what I'm doing. And, uh, and you know, that it's a great, like, it's a great, like, collaboration in that sense. And with The Quest, that was actually a reality show. So I, I'd imagine you kind of got to really um, mess with some of those, I don't know if you call them contestants or... Um, but... that, that, that's one of the things that made it so great for me now that you mentioned that. Yes, it was like, you know, there was a, a, a loose script, but it never went as planned because how could it? Because they don't have a script. I had a script. They didn't have a script. So even though they were coming to me and I had to hit certain points, at the same time, I had to go off what they were saying and it wasn't written. And, and, and that's why things and reactions came out from them, stuff with me, um, knowing the character and how he moved. And I was so comfortable with that. I could have the freedom to, to do something that wasn't written. And, and, and that's another reason I loved it so much. Um, and you're kind of a, in a way, an antagonist to them as well. So you you literally do get to, you, you kind of get carte blanche to antagonize people. <laughs> I'm I'm totally an antagonist. I'm a villain. All of them were villains, so they were all all a little afraid or supposed to be afraid of me and what I represented. So I had a power over them, also, which was really exciting and intoxicating as the character. I felt it. That's that's really cool. I mean, it sounds like it's fun. It, it's grueling, you know, being in those suits, and and it's it, it's a lot of work. But it sounds like ultimately there is a payoff. Now, do you feel that being a suit performer uh, for that amount of time, now that you're getting into uh, what I would call more, I hate to say conventional acting because nobody wants to be conventional, but you're you're out of the suit uh, and you're you're getting to emote, you know, with your own face, uh, has your experience being in the suits kind of helped to inform your acting, uh, out of them? I don't know if it, if it, if it's informed it, but it definitely helps with experience and confidence because when you're on like these huge sets with like, you know, and, and I'm getting to act, even if it's not, you know, as myself, you know, acting with David Harbour, I'm speaking the lines on set. You know, I'm right there with him. It makes you realize, like, I could be here right now as myself. You know, like, I am good enough to be head-to-head -head with these people. So I think it's more just the experience of doing it and the experience of working with these big directors, even if it hasn't been, even if it's been in makeup, it just gives me the confidence and um and stuff not really informing me but just the confidence of knowing that i could do this no matter what i'm playing that's that type of that's really great yeah and I, you know one of the things i think a lot of people who don't work in the business they don't realize that you know acting is uh it's not just being your character it's being aware of of the needs of <laughs> the director, the cameraman, the sound person, it's, it's, it's a lot to juggle. So it's having yeah. that confidence to, to show up and, and know that you can deliver on, uh, for all those people. Uh, I think that's, 
I mean, it just comes with experience of being seasoned, but it must be a, a great thing and, and kind of allow you to have more fun on set rather than be, you know, like a nervous newcomer. Yeah, well, that's the thing. The more you do it, the more, you know, you the more confidence you're going to have. So even though I've been in makeup on a lot of these big things, I, it's still experience on set. It's still hitting my mark. It's still delivering my dialogue or whatever it is. It's still it still counts in your mind as experience and doing it. So, you know, it, it definitely helps for all the acting I do to show up and have more confidence because it, it, it takes time to build that. It's just stuff doesn't happen overnight and you could fake it, but it's not the same, you know, I, I got to say as a director, it's, it's so, <laughs> uh, what's the word? It, it, I don't want to say refreshing because I've, I've worked with good actors, but you know, like I said, when you, when you get someone who's more seasoned on set, it's like one, one less thing you have to worry about because you know, well, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh no, no, that's, that's pretty much it. You know, it's like I said, I've worked with new actors and, and they did a great job for me, but it, it did, it, be, it kind of became a thing where I had to be very specific about what it was I was doing uh, every step of the way, you know, because yeah. if, if I, if I said, Hey, we're going to do this and they're going like, well, well, why, you know, this doesn't make sense to me. Then I'd have to explain to them, well, it's going to yeah. cut together like this. And, you know, yeah, exactly. Whereas a season pro, you don't have to, they don't question it. Like you don't even have to direct them a lot of times. I mean, you might once in a while go, Oh, you know what? I was just seeing it this way. Can you try this? But a lot of it, they're they're already there. They're already calm, prepared. They they know what they're gonna do, and they know they know their dialogue. They don't have you don't have to direct them as much. You just kind of let them go, right? I mean, yeah. That's, it, I mean, it really is. Uh, I forget who said it, but it was something to the effect of seventy five percent of of directing is casting well. Um, and boy, the True. the more work I do, the more I appreciate that. And I do I do like having new actors. Uh, on the set too because you know even though you have to do that extra work you can kind of mentor them as well but when you're busy and you know just that experience is gold it's invaluable so uh, yeah. that's all I want to say yeah. about that but anyway I, I think uh, I, I'm out of questions in terms of the practical effects aspect of, of your career do you have anything else you want to add? No, I, I think that we hit a lot of great stuff, and, and it's really great that you understand the process, because I felt like it was more about the process as opposed to a lot of interviews I do, where it's like, we're, they don't get that, they're just kind of talking about it. Well, thank you. Uh, That's actually yeah. the point of this show. This This show is for people who want to understand the process and want to hear where people are coming from with their process so that they can better theirs. So I really appreciate that you enjoyed the interview that way. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I enjoy talking about that more than, Oh, how was it working with David? Was he cool? You know, like, <laughs> like how was Mila? What was she like? It's like, you know, you can only go so far with that before it's like, okay, I'm done with talking about that. And, and besides, what else are you going to say? You know, you're not going to do an interview and go like, oh, I hated working with that person. Like, if, like yeah. you no, know, even if, even if there's people that I didn't enjoy, I'm not going to say that. Yeah. So it's, it's just phoniness, man. I'm just saying what you want to hear because I'm not going to be a, you know, mouth, bad mouth somebody. <laughs> For the record, before the, these interviews started, uh, Doug did say that he enjoyed working with them and that they were cool people. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, don't we're not we're not uh, backhanding them. Anyway, well, no, not. <laughs> thank you very much to everyone for listening. We're going to do a quick after show on my Patreon for the Patreon supporters. So if you're a Patreon supporter, please head over to Patreon and check that out. But uh, Doug, I want to say thank you so much for being on the Practical People. You're welcome. Thank you.